We're going to do a little reading in Matthew and a little bit in Luke as we take a, a little different perspective on the Christmas story. Uh, <clears throat> most of us are pretty familiar with the Christmas story, uh, so we won't exactly touch all that today. But in, in, in Matthew, starting in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we looked at some of this, but I want to pick up three thoughts about Jesus. And as the name of the message is Emmanuel, God is with us. Praise God, right? And uh, then we'll look at that he is also our Savior, which is in these verses. And also that he is, as we just sang, he is king. He's on the throne. One day, he's going to set up his throne again here upon this earth for a thousand year reign, the millennial reign, and then for eternity. And the Bible tells us some things about each one of those, and that's what we want to look at in just a minute, because he's more than just a baby in a manger. And uh, uh, Christmas has kind of got uh, messed up, you would say, in America today and in most of the world. And uh, it's not even about the babe in the manger most of the time. It's about the gifts. It's just about the gifts. And, uh, and he was the greatest gift ever given. And uh, the focus needs to be upon him. But he wasn't just a normal baby. Uh, he is abnormal. He was supernatural. Uh, so he was a special baby. And I know all those little babies and grandkids, they're just special. <laughs> but this one was even more special uh, uh, than our own. Uh, so in verse 18, so now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at that last week. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There's our memory verse. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, and that's the prophet Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now you can hold your fingers there for just a minute. Turn over to the first chapter, second chapter of Luke. I want to catch another perspective here of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2 starting in verse 1. And this is familiar again, the Christmas story, but I want to pick out some things a little different. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This first census took place while Quirinius was governor, uh, governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And I want you to know that both Mary and Joseph were the lineage of David. That's important for other things. And uh, especially if we're going to get a king from that baby. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there that the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Or I think the King James says, fear not. <laughs> Fear not, or do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. 
For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And uh, then back to Matthew, just a couple verses there. Matthew chapter 2. So we have shepherds and we have the wise men or magi. It depends on what translation you have. Now after Jesus was born, and I circle that word after. He's born. He's already, he's, he's, he's growing. And it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And we just sang about them and they followed the star. And uh, people tried to explain the star and say it was this or that. You know what? I believe it was the star. God pushed here and he led them to Jesus. Then it disappeared for a little bit there while they were, they were uh, talking with King Herod. And we're going to skip his story. It says, saying, where is he who was born what king of the Jews? So we read about that he was a savior. We read that he was God with us. And now we read that he was a king. And we sang about that. It's saying, where is he? who is king, born, born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Drop with me then over to verse 9. When they had heard the king, remember Herod has fits. <laughs> He's not happy that they're come to see a king because guess who's king? He's king. He doesn't like this baby. And of course, he will, he will decree the massacre of all the babies from two and under in the Bethlehem area. And uh, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the stars, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child and they came into the house. And again, our, our Christmas story gets a little messed up sometimes when we got the shepherds and we got the wise men all kneeling at the uh, manger. But this is two years later, maybe up to almost three years later. Uh, they're in the house and they're in Nazareth. And they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, who is this baby that's born on Christmas? Well, the scriptures gives us, like I said, some examples that he is God with us. He is our Savior. Even his name, it means that. Jesus, the Greek term, means God is our salvation. Joshua, the Old Testament word, is the same thing. God is our salvation. He is our Savior. And then he is King. Matter of fact, uh, Revelation says he is king of what? King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and so that's this baby. And, and, and when Brother Jim shows up, he'll probably sing for us about Mary, did you know? And uh, that song has a lot of theological truth in it. The thinking that when you kiss your baby, you kiss the face of what? Yeah. Of God. That, whew, that gives me goosebumps and chills to think. Uh, that Mary was holding uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as a babe in her hand, God of gods. And uh, so he came in the flesh. I still don't know that I completely understand that. How God could be man and God. We call that the theantrophic thing, but that's a big word. But anyhow, he was all God. and He's all man. Uh, theo meaning God. Anthropic meaning man. So that's what he was. Uh, he was uh, he was all God, but he was all man because he had to be man to become our what our savior. But he had to be God to be truthfully be our savior because if he wasn't, he wasn't a, a pure sacrifice. And uh, so, wow, a lot to think about. Who is the Christ of Christmas? To think about God coming and John says he came out and, and, and he tabernacled. He lived amongst us. Uh, he, he became flesh. So people could touch him. They could see him. We would know what God would look like if he was what? A man. And so if you want to know what God looks like in the flesh, you just study the life of Jesus. Because that's what Jesus could say this. When you see me, you see what? The Father. Because that's exactly what God would look like living in the flesh. And now remember as a, as a 
as a man, as a human, see some of the Christmas stories and songs, you know, away in the manger, no cry and he make. I, I don't believe that a bit. <laughs> I believe he came out screaming and crying just like every other baby does, right? They're gasping for air. They want to get fed. They want to get warm. They want to get taken care of. He was a baby. He was at, and, and he lived through those stages. Uh, that would be pretty interesting, changing the diaper of God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I just got through finishing Max Licato's book, and he, he goes through all those descriptions, and there are actually a lot of things put together from many of his other books. And he just puts real flesh to what's going on here. And it, it was a great... Uh, reminder for myself and a great enjoyable read and if you'd like to read it uh, I, I will be bringing it in uh, it also has a devotion in the back of it for the uh, 25 days leading up to Christmas so uh, I've been doing those each day and and it, and it emphasizes again another part to remember who this baby was it's real easy to just think he was just a baby, but he was a baby. Don't make him out. He didn't walk around with this halo over his head and shine and all that. He looked just like a what? A person. He was. <laughs> he looked like a Jew. And, and that's again, we have so many pictures of Jesus and he looks like he's German. Or he looks like he's Swedish because he's blonde headed, light headed and light complected. He was. That's not Jesus. He was dark haired, <laughs> dark complected. Uh, he was a Jewish person and uh, it said he looked like Jewish people. But it says there in Matthew 121 that he is God with us. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus wasn't God. I always just bring up this verse. I think that's a pretty simple verse, isn't it? It says his name will be Emmanuel, and that means what? God with us. <laughs> I don't know. Is that verse just hard to understand, hard to read? It says God with us. He was God in the flesh. And it's wonderful to know that God is with us. And this wasn't a new idea. 700, if you want to turn there, Isaiah. That's, that's back there in the middle of the white pages. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14. 700 years before Isaiah wrote this prophecy down. Isaiah 7, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And he's talking to Ahaz. And uh, Ahaz's wife will later have a son, but it didn't work out the way they, this says, because it wouldn't be conceived through a virgin. And uh, we see this taking place in Matthew, and it's quoted again. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So, uh, on unnamed angel has uh, told Joseph that in keeping with God's eternal plan that, pro that the prophet Isaiah spoke of 700 years earlier that a virgin would be with child. And we, we've talked about that. But that's very important. You can't let go of that. Uh, he had to be born of a virgin. Otherwise he couldn't be what? all God and all man without the sin nature. And so he had to be that perfect sacrifice. And, uh, and it said his name would be Jesus. And we've talked about that already. And that name means salvation is of God. This son would be a reminder that God was with his people and would care for them. God loved you enough that he took on flesh. We've been living in a very fearful world the last couple years. COVID has struck fear in the hearts of so many people. Isaiah says in Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, God speaking, for I am with you. He's God with us. He's here. He's with you. He goes on to say, Be not dismayed. Oh boy, is there people dismayed, discouraged, depressed through all this mess? The world's full of people that are there. And he says, for I am your God. He's with us. 
I, I want you to understand God is with you. No matter how difficult the times, no matter how dismal the outlook looks, God is still what? He's with us. And, and my Bible says that when God's with me, then I'm more than a conqueror. Uh, and it says also in Luke there, with God, nothing is what? Possible. So uh, I, I'm wanting to, and he says, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. My Bible says that I'm in the hands of the Lord, God the Father. I'm in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're coupled over like this and I'm in a nice spot. <laughs> and God's with me. And, and, and sometimes we just need him to put his arm around us, right? Pick us up. And, and I see an exciting story at Christmas because I see hope. And I see joy. And I see peace. It's all wrapped up right there in that little bitty baby. <laughs> Who's more than just a baby. But he is a baby. I don't want to leave either side of that apart. Isaiah 9, 6, if you're in Isaiah, just a little bit over, tells us a little bit more about this child. It's going to tell you about both of his natures. It was, again, our memory verse, uh, either last year or the year before. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. Child, speaking of his deity, son, speaking of his humanity. And he says, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It says, this child would one day, what, as Mark Lowry sings, rule the nations. And he's going to rule with an amazing wisdom, with amazing authority. And it says that he would, he would be a king that would have, would be a wonderful counselor. And most folks believe these Two are two word descriptions. Wonderful counselor. Otherwise, he's got wisdom that nobody else has. Why? Because he's who? God. The Bible tells us in Colossians that all of God's wisdom is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. If you want to know anything that God thinks, you can ask Jesus and he knows. And he can impart that wisdom to you. Now, do we know everything? No, Isaiah is clear to tell us later. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. His, his ways are far above ours. But God still wants us to know him, to understand him and understand his ways. And maybe one day after eternity, however long that is, after he teaches us for eternity, maybe we'll we'll know a little bit more of how great our God is and how wise he is. But he is a wonderful counselor. Uh, that word wonderful could be translated exceptional or distinguished. He will distinguish himself among leaders because he is God. It says also that he is, and it tells us there that he is mighty God. Speaking of his power, his ability to do anything. Nothing is outside the power of God. People look at creation and think it just happened. No, it's a picture of an almighty, powerful God who spoke it into existence. He didn't have to even get out the shovel. He didn't have to get out the hammer. He didn't have to get out any tools. He just said, let there be light. And there was what? Light. Let there be man, let there be plants, let there be water, let there be the everything. And he just spoke it into creation. That, that's the mighty God. And he will be ruling. So you don't pull anything over on him. He's too smart for that. And he's too powerful to ever think of overthrowing. Because it's sad to think, but during the millennial kingdom, even though all saved people go in, there's people being born at the end of it. They're still trying to what? overthrow Jesus Christ and God the Father will put it into that real quick 
<laughs> as we go into eternity. Everlasting Father. When I think of the word Father, I think of someone who cares, who is concerned, who teaches, who who uh, disciplines. <laughs> a good father is a, one who disciplines and one who loves and cares and nurtures. Uh, as, uh, uh, and, and so he's my everlasting father. And then he's the prince of peace. And this world is lacking peace physically and spiritually. Uh, there's no peace. Jesus says, I come to give you true peace. Not as the world offers. He gives you peace with God because of his sacrifice. And then what I pray for often now is the peace of God that passes all understanding. And uh, that's, that's who he is. That's who this baby is. He is God with us. And one day he will, as a Davidic king, as I shared with you, he will be sitting on that throne and, excuse me, ruling here upon this earth. One other thing that I know that he's God, because what did the wise men do when they presented the gifts? It says they worshipped him. My Bible's clear that you should worship nobody but who? Can you imagine? He's two or three years old and here comes wise men. Probably very rich, wealthy men. Magi, star. They, they worship the stars. You might wonder, where did they find out about the star? I believe you have to talk to Brother Daniel about that one. It says they came from his area and Daniel taught people about the Lord and about the prophecies concerning him. And that's what many believe that Daniel passed that on to them. And they were watching and waiting. They were stargazers. They were studying the stars. They were magi. They were wise men and they searched for the sun and God gave them a miracle and they followed it and saw Jesus and they worshiped him. They worshiped him with what gold? Many believe the gold is for his royalty. They gave him frankincense, which was for his deity. And they gave him myrrh for his humanity. You know that myrrh is used for the embalming of someone who has died. And so even there, we see pictures of who he is and what he was going to do for his humanity. And then folks say that when, he was, when they had to leave and go to another country, they lived off the gold. And uh, God provided for that family in that fashion. So he was Emmanuel, God with us. Number two, I have, uh, as you go on to go back there to Matthew, that he is our Savior. He came to save his people from their sins. His name tells us that. Simeon, who in uh, Luke sees he's 80 something years old and he sees the baby and he holds him in his hand and he picks him up like this and Joseph and Mary have to be shocked because Simeon says I've been waiting for him how did he know that that was the baby <laughs> that was and, and remember they go in at how, how eight days remember you got to eight days go in and offer the sacrifices and be what circumcised if you're a boy Girls be happy. You can bypass that one. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he, eight days they bring him in. Simeon says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now he says, I can go. <laughs> you can let me go out of here. And the Lord had promised him he would see that. Anna, the next one, Anna, the prophet, says she spoke of him. And, and, and to all those who look for redemption in Israel. Now remember, Israel was also looking for a person who come in and relieve them of all the government oppression that was over them. But he had come, of course, to pay for their sins. And so Joseph, as he has been told these things, and as he's going through, think of Jeremiah, and it says about the new covenant. One day I'm going to come, and I'm going to give people a new heart. And I'm going to work that through and that's in Jeremiah 31 33 he said so he said he's seeing prophecy fulfilled 
That's very important that Jesus fulfilled every aspect of prophecy. Because if there's just one that he doesn't, then guess what? Then he's not the true Christ. He's not the true anointed one. He's not the true fulfillment of those things. And who did he die for? He died for us. He died for all of us. Uh, the most favorite verse in the Bible, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He died. Yes, he died for the Jewish folks. But as you study those scriptures, he died for the world. It says in 1 John 4.10, And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. There's your big word. That means satisfaction for our sins. He died and paid the price for our sins and satisfied the wrath of God. That's why you're going to be in heaven and why you won't be in hell. <laughs> it's because he, this baby with Easter in mind died there at Calvary to pay for your sins and be the propitiation. That's the same word that they used in the Old Testament to describe the mercy seat. That's the seat that's on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. That's where one time a year the priest went in and sprinkled some blood to be a propitiation, to be a satisfaction, to delay, actually at that time, the payment for the sins. And it's a picture of what Christ would do on the cross for us. He's our Savior. And He is the only way to heaven. Uh, it's being knocked today and again. Uh, there is only one way to get to heaven, and that's Jesus. And Peter preached it, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. One way, one person, one mediator, Paul tells us. And Paul says also in Timothy that Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins. That's why he came. That's why that babe was there. That's why he came in a, in a person's body. He is also, says in Matthew 2 and, and I, Isaiah there as we read, that the government would be on his shoulders. And the government that he is in charge of and he is king over will have no end. Now if you go back and study the Davidic covenant, God promised David that he would have a son on the throne forever. And we know that's not true right now. Well, on earth. But it is true in heaven. Jesus is on the throne. He is king. And he would set up on the throne of David. That's why it was important that Joseph and Mary were from the line of who? David. That's why they had to go to Bethlehem. Which was another prophecy in Micah 5, 2. Fulfilled. And the Lord will give the, him the throne of his father David. That's what it tells us in Matthew or Luke 1, 32. And he will reign forever. Following the kingdom on earth, he will rule for eternity. And he will maintain righteousness. He's on the throne now. That's the only way I can rest in what's taking place in our world today. Knowing that Jesus is on the throne. He's not on the cross. That's, I still haven't checked that out to know why the Catholics have him on the cross yet. Judy, you may be able to help me out. I don't know. <laughs> why they have him on the cross, I don't know. Because he's not on the cross, he's on the throne. And uh, uh, he is there and he's going to stay there. And he's coming back, it tells us, before he gets on the earthly throne, he's going to come back riding a, a white horse. And remember on his, that's where it says on there that it's written on him that it says King of King and Lords of Lords. And he will come back and set up his kingdom. And Revelation 19 tells us about that. Remember, Jesus offered the Jews the kingdom. And they what? They rejected it. Next time, they'll be begging him to come back. It says they're going to worship him and they're going to praise him. And they'll see him. And he will come back after the great tribulation. So who is this baby? God with us. 
So when you think of the Christmas story, just remember, God says, fear not, for I am what? I'm with you. I'm with you. Savior of the world. Praise God that he came to die for my sins. That's, that's the emphasis of the Christmas story. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Praise God. Remember to thank him for that. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we sing a couple of little choruses about King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Glory. Hallelujah. Okay. And then we do it faster and faster. And, uh, and then we have to watch out so Lynette doesn't do his little Russian dance there. So, because uh, it's kind of got that beat. <laughs> and, uh, and so I pray that your understanding of who Jesus is will be uh, increased. And that he was God in the flesh. And I've had those discussions with those folks that don't believe that. I said, you just show me from the Bible that it says God, that he was not God in the flesh. You got to take out a couple verses right there in Isaiah. And you got to take out there in, in Luke and in Mark. Uh, I mean, Matthew. And then the question is, is he your savior? He is a savior. But that won't get you to heaven. He's got to be your savior to get you to heaven, right? There's a lot of difference about that. Uh, and I always use an example. I know who Abraham Lincoln is, but I don't know Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> One thing, he died a long time ago. Well, so did Jesus. <laughs> but my Jesus is still living. And I can know about somebody, but not know somebody. You need to know him as your Savior. At one time in your life, remember, when you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And then he says, when you do, I'll come in. <laughs> and that's his part. He always keeps his word. And so, praise God for that. Do you live as he is King and Lord of your life? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a hard one. It's easy to say that he is Lord, but it's not easy to live. So I live with him as my Lord as he is my priority. And we talked a little bit about our priority list. Our priority list is what God, then family. Or if, as a husband, I have my priority list is God and then my wife. If you're a wife, then the second one is your husband. Now, that's going to mess with some people in this world today because they got two wives and two husbands. I, I couldn't figure out why they kept the name. If they don't believe what God says, why are they still husbands and why are they still wives? But anyhow, uh, and then, then the next one on my list is my children. Then the next one on the list is my job. That's my priorities. Keep God first. How do I know that? A lot of times I can check that by my pocketbook, right? What do I invest in the kingdom of God? And uh, then I look at my schedule. Because do I invest time in doing things that count for the kingdom? That's, that's really easy to come up short in. And, uh, and, and so... And then I can check it on how much time do I spend in this book. And we can go down through the list. But anyhow, there we are. Is he the Lord of your life? May we do as the wise men. And what did they do? They knelt before him and they gave him gifts. And uh, you know what gift God wants from you? You. <laughs> That's what he wants. He wants you. Uh, he doesn't need your money. I told you when I first got saved, I heard a preacher say that. I thought, man, it's not what I heard. <laughs> I heard the church wants your money. And he said, I, no, God doesn't need your money. I said, huh. All right, I'll put it back in my pocket. No, I, I, I think God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need you. But he chose you because he loves you and he wants to be with you. He you don't do anything to enhance God and who he is. He already is everything. He's perfect. He's wonderful. He's glorious. He's rich. <laughs> All those things. So I can't give him money and God become more wealthy. Because he already owns everything. It's those things. And remember, he wants you. Now I'm not telling you that God doesn't want you to be a faithful giver. 
But he wants you to give of your time, your talents, and your treasures. He wants all of you. And so when he asks you to do that, that's the greatest Christmas gift. And Paul described it, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. There it was. That little. I don't know how little he was. Because <laughs> some of those babies come out pretty good size, you know. Uh, I saw a new one the other day. It was just a little bitty thing. Babies are so cute. And uh, even when they're not your own grandkids or whatever, but I see them, I just think, babe, I, I think pregnant women look cute too. You know, I just think it's a wonderful thing thinking there's a life in there. And, uh, and the dis disrespect for life today. And I, I, I appreciate women that will carry that baby even if they don't have a daddy on this side of it, you know, that he participated, but he's not around. You know what I mean? But when I see that little baby, I just think the miracle of life. And then I always think of the baby Jesus and what he was and what he became because he loved me and he died for us.